It's white to move and mate in two moves, and this is composed by the wonderful Pal Banco, who still works writing uh, chess columns every month for chess play. So, mate in two, obviously if you were trying to win the game, you could do so in so very many ways, right? You could just play queen takes queen, you could play f5 check, but we're looking for a mate in two moves by force. So this is a chess problem. A problem means that it was composed by scratch, and of course it's in honor of Valentine's Day because, why, is it, why did I show this in Valentine's Day? Anything you notice about the, the position? Yes, it's shaped like a heart, right? It's a Valentine's Day chess problem. So that's really hard. Not only did this composer, I mean, Benko I think is amazing. Not only did he have to create a maiden two that was beautiful, because otherwise there's no real point of maiden two. The point of them is that they're supposed to be really difficult to find in a way and also to have like some kind of beautiful and surprising solution. And then in addition to that, it had to be shaped like a heart. You already have the answer? Well, F5 would be mate in one. Well, it's not mate. F5's not mate because the queen can take. Mm -hmm. Right, so we're not just talking about good moves here because we've already conceded that if White was just trying to win this game, there would be many, many ways he could do that. We're just trying to find the forced mate in two. And that's what we do with chess problems. A lot of times it's not about winning the game, it's just about finding the forced mate. Also important for chess problems is that if the mate in two, it's only considered to be a good or high quality chess problem if there's only one mate in two. If there are multiple mates in two, then it's not considered a good problem and those multiple mates in two are called, anybody know what it's called when there's an alternate solution to a problem? Hmm? Unsound? No. No. Anybody uh, study chess problems before? No, the, the, the term for it is a cook. I don't know where it came from, actually, but it's called a cook. And the cooks are considered bad. You don't want to have cooks. There should only be one way to mate in two. I know you know. <laughs> He's just letting some other people try to get a chance to solve it. No, it's white's move. White's move. White's made in, move and made in two. Well, yeah, and we already talked about how taking the queen is just winning, right. but we're looking for uh, made in two because it's a composed chess problem. The difference between a puzzle, usually in a puzzle I'm just saying, well, what's the best move? How do you win? Whereas a chess problem, there's usually a very specific stipulation. And this one is white to made in two. Now, people ask, does studying chess problems make you better at chess? Because usually it's unrealistic situations. Like, you don't normally find yourself in a chess game and your pieces are shaped in a heart. I mean, unless <laughs> you're, you're really trying hard to make that happen or torture your opponent. Or you're giving them a Valentine's Day, ch you know, chess problem present. But uh, it does help your chess because it really improves your creativity. And chess is really important. I, last, last night when I was doing the intermediate class, we were talking about all these different um, beautiful quiet moves. And one of them included a king march that was very surprising in the middle of the board. And actually, you found it. So it was pretty cool. But the point is that problems help creativity. Even if it's not realistic, it helps you expand your mind so that when you're sitting there at the board, you're not just thinking about the first thing that you look at, but you're, you're thinking about weird things. And once in a while, those weird things work. No, our friends in the back are probably going to get this because you guys are 
pretty good for the uh, advanced beginners class. <laughs> You're both rated what about 1700? Okay, that's all right. So that's good that you came in late for this problem because, you know, but don't call it out. Just, just in general in this class, like try to um, raise your hand at all times because I, I expect that you might get some things faster than the rest of the people, which is to it's totally fine that you're here. Just want to make sure everybody can uh, get a chance to solve the puzzles as well. So let me just go around and review some names. So we've got Chris, Sal, Tommy, Zeev, Zeev. Yeah. How do you spell like Z E? Z E V E. Oh, that's such a cool name, Zeev. And Azim. Azim. Oh wow, a lot of Zeevs. <laughs> uh, Zeev and Azim. <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not difficult. Yeah. Uh, Vincent. Vincent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I only missed you. Kevin. Kevin. Okay, good. It's, you're looking for a mate in two. Yes, mate in two moves, exactly. Mate in two moves, exactly. F5 check, queen takes pawn. It's not mate. So basically, if you're trying to mate in two, it's got to be you move, they move, checkmate, right? That's a mate in two. So you don't have a lot of room for error. Hmm? Who asked that? Oh, Tom. Thomas, Thomas, right? Um, yes, the first move is a check, which is some, it's kind of unusual in problems. A lot of times they like to use those quiet moves that we talked about yesterday. For those of you who weren't at the lecture on Quiet Moves, it will be uploaded onto YouTube on the um, St. Louis Chess Club YouTube channel, which is just St. Louis Chess, right? Yeah, STL Chess Club. STL Chess Club, yeah. So STL Chess Club, it'll be up there. And the first move is knight d8? No, the first move is not knight d8. Um, that's a good idea, though, because in these problems, you really want to look at all possibilities. But if you were to play knight d8, I would just play bishop takes d8, and then you wouldn't have a maiden one there. So you need to have a maiden one after you make the move. You guys have it in the back. Let's let's give everybody another minute. But uh, if I if nobody gets it in a minute or two, I'll, I'll call on you. Yeah. Got it. Got it. You got it. Okay. Cool. That's an interesting hint. I gave it a hint. I said no. I, I, I would have an interesting hint for people who haven't. Oh, what's your hint? Think outside the box. Okay. Hmm. That's good because I thought you were, I thought you might give a hint that you said think outside the box. I thought you were going to give a hint that was like going to totally give it away. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, well, I'll give you guys a hint. It's a it's it's a check and it's a sacrifice. Are we supposed to say it every now and Yeah, it's a, what do you you got it? It's queen e4. No, queen e4 is not it because if queen e4 bishop takes queen and that's also a check, so that's not quite right. August, you got it? C4, I'm sorry. C4, yeah. I can't C4 is a really good idea, but that's actually not right because queen C4 is a really good idea because if queen takes queen, then what's the mate in one? Pawn. Yes, pawn F5 is mate, right? But it's not a mate in two because if you played queen C4 check, I could block and then it just wouldn't be mate, right? You wouldn't have that mate. Queen d6, yeah, you should have raised your hand because I think some other people had it. But that is good. Queen d6 is the move. So if queen takes d6, what's the mate? Hmm? Mm -hmm. And if bishop takes, what's the mate? Azim? No, because then queen takes pawn. So if, if, if queen, queen d6, bishop takes 6, give me a square. Knight d8, exactly. So the key here is queen d6, a very pretty move. That's what you were thinking, right? 
Okay, good. So everybody was in, in the back, Julian and Justin. Oh, okay. All right, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's surprising how hard Mason 2 can be. And this is from uh, Benko's uh, book, of, of, uh, a book about his life by Jeremy Sillman, which also has lots of great compositions by him. And it is really astonishing. You'd think that if you get to a pretty strong level on chess, you wouldn't have trouble finding mates in two, but sometimes it's hard. And after bishop takes d6, knight d8 is a very pretty mate. And of course, if queen d6, queen takes d6, f5. So for those of you who have girlfriends and wives who you de decided not to take out on Valentine's Day, you can make it up to her by just showing her this position when you come home. She'll be totally even, basically, right? That's a great idea. I'm glad I came. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, okay, exactly, yes. That's one way to look at it. Yeah, I lost to a background checkmate actually when I was like already a master because I think I was playing in a simultaneous and it's, it's like, it's the one way it's easy to lose in a simultaneous because you're just, you're just like racing around the board making moves quickly and I had forgotten to make Luft and this like little kid just checkmates me and He's, he's probably like a thousand or something and you know making fun of me for that for the rest of the chess camp it was pretty awful like i really <laughs> really was not happy about that i'm not the type of person where if i give a simul i'm trying to crush every single person like i'm also trying to play quickly but i don't really like losing very much <laughs> so this one is just white to move and win so this kind of takes advantage. So like a, a lot of the problems I'm going to show you now are a bit variations on the back rank mate. So how to use the idea, because most of your opponents, unless it's, they're under a lot of pressure, whether it's like my case, I was playing 30 games at once, or they just have a couple minutes left on the clock. For whatever reason, most people of your level are not going to just fall into a back rank checkmate for no reason. Usually it's going to be because you set it up, right? that you did something clever which caused them to forget about it or to miss something. And this takes advantage of two themes. Usually, in, practically speaking, in chess, there are often two themes at work. In this case, we're making use of the back rank theme, and we're also making use of the pin theme. Yes, rook f8. Um, please, uh, you know, use your hand because you solved two in a row now, Eve. But rook f8 is the right answer because then if queen takes queen, we've got rook takes g8, mate. So that's kind of like a back rank. It's like a variation on it. And now I wanted to show you a game, uh, interesting, just the, m we'll kind of go through the opening quickly, but this is a game from the strongest female chess player in history, Judith Polgar. And this was from an Olympiad when she was about 12 at the time of the game, so it's a pretty impressive display by her. Anybody know what this opening is called? Great, yes, it's called the Rosalimo Sicilian. The Sicilian is defined when your opponent plays e4, when you play e4 and your opponent plays c5, and move that queen's bishop pawn forward. Anybody in this room play c5 in response to e4? Okay, a few people in the back. The rest of you probably mostly play e5 in response to c e4? Yeah. Julian? Yeah. You mostly play e5 and c5? I play both. You play both, great. And then knight f3 is the most common response. And now after knight c6, the most typical response in this position is d4. But bishop b5 is also a, a pretty good move. A lot of people play this as well. So now black is fee and kettling, and now What's the point of c3? Why do you think white would play c3? What do you think, Chris? Any thought why white would play c3? Yeah. August? Is it prepared d4? Yes, that's the reason. Which is a particularly effective setup to have when your opponent's bishop is being kettled. So e5, and now white played d4 anyway, so she decided to sacrifice a pawn. And we'll see why she did that in a minute. So I guess her idea in this position is that the black king is a little bit open, and this is also not exactly a clean pawn. This pawn is also pinned, so it's a bit tricky for black to complete all of her development. So now she did another sacrifice by playing e5. And what do you think would happen if black were to play bishop takes e5 here? 
How would white play here? What's that? If they play bishop takes e5? Or just in general? <laughs> they should just like unregister from the tournament beforehand. <laughs> Rook e1, okay. Um, and then if black were to play f6, um, somebody else, you know, white just plays what? Yeah. yeah. So obviously black can't take on e5. So instead black played knight e7, and now white played bishop d5, creating another pin. Now black castle, white captures on d4. Now after knight c6, queen h4, hitting the queen, queen to b6, knight c3, continuing development. So you see there's a lot of issues here with the development. It's very difficult to develop these pieces. And it's very difficult to move this pawn forward, because if this pawn were to move forward, what would happen? Chris, we, we did talk about this. What's the problem with moving the pawn forward to d d5? Well, you know, a lot of the times the knight would be able to take, but there's something else. I'm going to let Chris answer this, because he's, like, starting out. Um, it was a special rule that we talked about at the beginning of the class. Oh, he can't. Yeah. Pawn. Right. Well, he can, but if he does, you get to use the rule. Right, it's called opposite. Yeah. yeah. So the d5, the problem is that the d5 is stuck in. So if you can't develop the d pawn, you can't develop the bishop, and if you can't develop the bishop, you can't develop the rook. So lack of development has sometimes got that like kind of domino effect. And now finally, black decided to take the pawn off, and white got another piece into play. You'll see that in a lot of attacking players' games that the key is getting all of the pieces into the game. They also call that inviting everyone to the party. Again, we saw that variation on that yesterday in that famous short Taman game where Julian found the king f4 motif. So rook a e1. And by the way, what is, what is white's direct threat in this position? What is white's what? What's white's threat in this position? If it were white's move, it's black's move. And by the way, rook e1 is a big sacrifice. But if it were white's move in this position, what would white do? Probably Well, that's what black did. Because black, uh, oh, wait, which one? For white. That's why you should, yeah, what, use algebraic notation, yeah? Well, bishop takes knight, and then bishop takes c6, and then after pawn takes? Then take the bishop. Exactly. So that tactic is called? Uh, no, removing the defender. Oh. Yeah. And so it's black's move, though. So black used the same technique herself to capture this bishop on, on b5. So this was a sacrifice. The sacrifice began with rook a e1, because it allows bishop takes c3. And now after pawn takes e3, the bishop on b5 is hanging. So again, removal of the guard. So pretty common tactic. And now why would white sacrifice a piece here? What do you think white can do in this position? This is a pretty awesome game, actually. Bishop. Bishop h6 is a really good idea, but if bishop h6, how can black reply? And this is something we talked about, I think, yesterday also, and maybe last week as well. Your biggest goal, if you're getting attacked, is to try to trade what? Pieces, but specifically queens. The reason is that you, you hardly ever hear about somebody getting into an endgame and then just getting checkmated in the open board. It happens, but it's pretty rare. Normally, the endgame is defined by the fact that the king is no longer in danger directly, right? That, you know, obviously somebody might queen a pawn, and then it's going to be in danger again. But in the endgame, king safety is usually not the big issue. And that's why a lot of times in the endgame, if you're uncastled, you'll see people playing king e7 or king d7 rather than castling, right? So black would play what? Yeah, queen h5 seems like a good move, and this kind of ruins your idea of playing queen to a f6, because now I could take this, right? So bishop h6, and I don't mind, but I don't mind losing this, because I'm still going to be up in material, because you sacrificed a piece. So if you were to take and take on f8, I'd still be ahead of material, right? Because I've got the knight and the bishop versus the rook, and that's worth more. And in this position, notice I don't have to worry about development anymore, and that's why trading to the end game is so great for a player who's getting attacked, because now I am going to have time to play d5 and bishop e6 and move my rook out. 
Definitely a good idea, but not the right one. What else can we consider? You guys already got it in the back? No. Kind of? You're still analyzing? Yeah, we're kind of thinking. Okay. That's good. Bishop B7? Bishop B7, you don't really want to trade pieces when you're attacking. You know, like, I'll probably just take it. And I'll be happy because this bishop's a key attacker. This bishop's a very strong piece. And that's why the suggestion of bishop h6 is a really good one. Because we're trying to get in those squares and checkmate. Another move that I would certainly look at, but I'd probably reject for the same reasons, would be what? What's another right? Try to get into those squares and mate them. Yeah, bishop f6. I'd probably look at bishop f6 too, but also queen h5 could, could be um, a concern there. So, anyway. Any other ideas? So we've looked at different move orders. We tried bishop f6, we tried bishop h6, and all times the idea is to put the queen there and then get the queen to g7 mate, right? But this queen coming over and threatening to trade itself is, keeps annoying us. So, yeah? So where, where would you move the queen to? Not, not your queen, you could move the other queen. Oh, you mean like play, play what? Play the pawn. Yeah, you could do that. I think the problem with that is that if you were to play c4 here, and then I play queen to f5, that helped me because this queen is, is useful here as a defender. Because it helps promote like f6. So the problem is, I, it's not like I'm going to move the queen somewhere like that, like out of the game, right? Queen, yeah. um, queen h6 was played, yes. And let's try to figure out why. So queen h6 was played, and now what's white threatening? If it's white's move in this position, what will white play? An easy one, but... Yeah, bishop f6 and it's just forced mate. There's just no way to stop mate, right? So how can black stop it? What are black's different ways of stopping it? Well, taking the bishop's pretty bad, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can take the bishop and just play a few more moves and resign. Yeah, yeah, you could resign. You can resign. But queen takes g5 is not something you really, like if you see that your opponent has to play queen takes g5, then you don't really need to analyze it anymore because it's after queen takes g5, you've reached a logical conclusion. There's no more checks, there's no more captures, and you're up a queen for two pieces. So that's the point at which you're like, okay, I'm going to play this move. <laughs> what, el what else can black do to stop mate besides queen takes bishop? F6, good. What else? Let's just try to think of all the candidate moves for defending. Yeah? Sal? Well, pawn. pawn, that's that's what uh, Z said also, though. F6 or F5, yeah? Okay, but let's look at that first, and then we'll look at other possibilities. Okay, so say they play F6 here. Now, what can white do? Um, what is pawn? August? Bishop takes f6. Yeah. Bishop f6. Then you could do rook e8. Bishop f6, rook f6, yeah. Well, bishop takes f6, uh -huh. rook e8. And then king f7. Um, at that point, uh, queen uh, f8. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, so bishop f6 is mating. Um, because if rook f7, we can just go rook e8. But question though, what if white were to try to reverse the move order? Because move order is a really important concept in chess, and this position kind of illustrates it. 
If we were to play rookie eight first, what would black do? Why is that different? With the same idea that we, after rook takes e8, bishop f6 and mate on g7. Where is the uh, hole in that thinking? Yeah, probably there's a couple holes, actually. At least one. <laughs> right. Well, okay, after black takes the rook and then bishop takes f6, how can you defend against the mate? You could defend with king f7, although I still have queen g7 check and rook e1, so that looks pretty dangerous. What other way could you defend against it? There's another way. If rook e8, rook takes e8, bishop takes f6. In addition to playing king f7, you could also play... Remember, when your opponent sacrificed a lot of material, it gives you license to re-sacrifice the material for the defense. Justin? You see it? Rook e8, rook takes e8, bishop takes pawn, and then... Yeah, rook e7 is a pretty good move because you, after a bishop takes e, e7, knight takes e7, you're actually up two pieces, right? So once you start sacking, um, you always have to be aware of re-sacrifices or counter-sacrifices because your opponent usually has a lot of flexibility to do that, especially when you start giving up a lot. So bishop f6 seems to work there. So instead of, and by the way, the same exact variation on f5, right? Just because we're not taking a pawn, all the variations basically stay the same. So instead, what's the other way to defend against bishop to f6? So only other way that black can stop white from playing bishop f6. Hmm? Pawn f5 is kind of the same, though, because we just play bishop f6. Queen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Queen f5, exactly. Uh, five, sorry. And now, what do I do? No yelling out. Raise your hand if you get it. One second, let me just give people a, a couple more people a chance. Anybody else see it? So you got a really good combination here as white. You got it, okay, good. It's actually, I'll give you a hint, it's actually a mate in three. So that's how brutal this position is. Why well, you can actually mate in three moves starting from this position. Got it? Oh, a couple of people got it. August? I can see by the smiles. I think. Okay. Well, you should know. I think if you see it, you know, right? Yeah. 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 What's that? Oh. I, I think I've got it. Okay, go. Uh, queen takes rook. Very good. Queen takes rook check. King takes rook. And then what? Bishop to uh, h6 check. Mm-hmm. King uh, g8. King, uh, king g8. Excellent, very good. So a very beautiful romantic move. Queen takes f8, romantic in Valentine's Day again. King takes f8, bishop h6 check. And again, we saw that this look not being as good as the other look. Of course, it was, it was kind of destined to be this way because black had fee and cat on a bishop there. So it's not like she tried to play g6 to make look. What's that? I can't read the name, who's black? 
and Angelova. I don't, I don't, I haven't really seen her name much since then. It was a long time ago. It was in '89 or no, the '88 Olympiad. So after Bishop H6 check, King can't go here because of the rook, and now when the king goes to G8, Rook E8 is mate. So very, very pretty finish there by Judah Polgar and a very classic example of why it's important to develop early because. If you know even one of these pieces had been out, or if this pawn had been advanced, it would have been much easier for Black to defend by simply moving a bishop at some point to stop the mating. Is so, exactly playing a bishop and a rook down the whole game, it's not usually a good strategy. <laughs> so, good good finds, guys. Let's look at another example. Oh, and this is a very famous game, but I'm going to take it to the I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through this because we don't have time to look at the whole game. But this is a really cool game with a Capablanca game. Training mode, okay. This one you'll see in almost all your tactics books. That's one of the reasons I wrote Play Like a Girl, because there are some amazing tactics that are used over and over again. Like this one is really a cool tactic. But I also find that, especially before the tactics trainers online started to become popular, a lot of people in writing tactics book were recycling the same positions. And I found that unfortunate because there are so many fresh positions and tactics being created in modern games, like the one we just looked at, that queen takes f8 thing. And naturally, more women playing now than ever so what generally happened when people were recycling tactics, there were very few games by women in these books. So um, the book I wrote, Play Like a Girl, has tactics all by female chess players. So it wouldn't have included this one, but that's okay. And now, black to move. Yes. He's got it already, one sec. I'll call on you in a minute, just like give, give me the rest. Half a minute, minute. <laughs> you don't believe me. I say that and then I forget and I call on somebody else, right? I keep doing that. <laughs> but you got a lot of them right in the beginning of the class, so. Well, if you play queen check, my only move is queen f1, right? Yes. And then if you play, if you play rook to d1, what happens? Right, so you've got an issue where both players have weakened back ranks. Got it, Sal? You got, it? I got an idea? Oh, or are you distracting? <laughs> Zeev, what do you think? Queen B1. Well, queen to B1 and then queen F1? Do do well, that was just mentioned, but then you missed, you missed something at the end of it. Remember, look at your opponent's ideas, not just your own. Right? What do you miss? Your back rank's weak too, right? So if queen b1, queen f1, rook d1, we get to play rook c8 mating. Well, it's not really, well, it's like, you're going to win. 
I'm going to say it's a mate. Yeah? Queen B2. Queen B2 is the correct move. Very good. Very nice move. Now, the idea is if queen takes queen, black just has, just has rook d1 mate. So what are white's other options? If white tries to cover the back rank with something like queen e1, now what can uh, black play? Someone else? Better. We got a lot better than that. Sal? Huh? Mm -hmm. Now we can play queen takes rook, and if queen takes queen, rook d1 is mating, right? So the only other possibility that we haven't really looked at is, well, what if rook c2? Trying to just... What does not change? Well, now if we play queen takes rook, though, queen takes queen, it guards the d1 square, right? So it changes things a little bit. Right, exactly. Queen b1. And now it's different than the other position because now when the queen goes to f1, instead of rook d1, which will still lead to mate, you can simply go, you can simply take the rook, right? So that's a pretty cool position. And this, this again, you'll see in all tactics books. Very good. Right. So imagine they were on the same file and you have protected piece that can move on right, you know what I mean. Well, I really like this move because it's cool, like in a way it's a, it's it's it looks like a slashing move because we're attacking we're sacrificing the queen, but it's also kind of a quiet move in a way because in the end the whole point is that you're just gaining that one little tempo. Or that one little no nuance that the rook is now under under so capture. The defense there not able to even help though. No, there's not really a defense now. I mean, you can't really you can't protect this rook and protect this queen and protect this checkmate. Right. It's just an overloading situation. What those pawns do is just really kind of expand mm -hmm. the size of the king. Well, the thing about these pawns is generally it's a great place. Generally, you don't want to move your pawns in front of your king too much because it makes the king weak. But in the case of back ranks, you can't use that principle, you can't hold on to that principle so much because once pieces start trading off, this pawn formation actually ends up trapping the king, whereas before it was protecting it. So that's why once you see files opening, that's usually a good moment to play something like h6 and make yourself that error. Early in the game, a lot of times you want to keep your pawns just like that, especially if it's closed. I mean, it really depends, but sometimes you don't want to touch them. And you almost certainly don't usually want to play like g5 and h5 type moves, leaving your king naked. All right, this is in, an, another one. So this is a black to move. Black to move and win. And there's just, I mean, this one should be easy for you because of what we looked at, but it's, it's interesting because there's just a couple of different things that might come to your mind first. Well, queen e3, yeah, that's what, that is not the best move because if you play queen e3, then what can your opponent do? I think an arrow just showed it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, August? Uh, going back from the original position. Well, but white can mate here, right? Yes. Yeah. So always looking for your opponent's ideas too. So instead in this position, you do want to use that bank rank distraction idea, but the, at queen e3 is the wrong execution. Instead, August? Queen b1. Queen b1 is the correct execution because now you're continuing to cover all of these squares. So in a weird way, you're attacking and defending at the same time, right? So the only way for white to play now, if we take on b1, there's that brutal checkmate. So instead, we move the queen, trying to hold on to both this bishop. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Trying to hold on to both this bishop and this square. So queen is, is quite a bit overloaded here. And now what can black do? How does black finish it off now? Okay. 
queen to d1. And now if I play queen takes d1, oh, ah. if I play queen takes d1, what do you do? Check, check mate. mate, and if I play queen e3, you also have rook f1, you know, just winning all the pieces. Um, another way to win here, similar concept, queen e4, right? All right, good. So the thing about themes is that once you look at a lot, of, a lot of problems in one theme, they start to become much easier, right? There's one more I wanted to show you. Yeah, this position. So it's like the first one is harder, but then you keep looking at the theme, and it becomes very easy. And that's, that's why you study tactics, so that themes that would be difficult if you saw them for the first time will become quite quickly for you. And that's called pattern recognition. And it's really important. It's hard to become a strong player if you haven't put in a lot of hours studying those tactics and doing those drills. And we've discussed it before. You can use books and a combination of books and computer training. But you've got to do something. This one's a white move. Just white to move and win. Rook on after you on, okay, Z. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And this is just I just get put this one in because everything else we looked at was quite flashy, and this one's more of a quiet move, which is absolutely winning. You're just attacking E8 too many times. There's no way for them to get the rook to defend the square another time, right? So sometimes if your opponent's back rank is weak enough, even if they see the threat, you know, there's nothing they can do about it, right? This rook can't come back. This rook is pinned, so it can't go to e7. And this rook is unable to come back to the back rank. And that's why a lot of the times you don't see people, even though I think yesterday I showed you guys an example of a rover, rook up and over, which is often a way to get the rook into the attack. A lot of times you see people keeping the rooks on the back rank for at least a while because it's important to have some protection there. Queen where? Um, in this position? Yes. Queen c8? You can take it. Maybe you were thinking of queen c7, but yeah, queen c7, if queen takes c7, rook e8 would be a good idea, but instead of playing queen takes c7, you've removed the pin now, so he can, he can just take with a rock, right? But I've been showing so many sacrifices, I can see why you would just immediately gravitate towards looking at a sack. But anyway, um, so yeah, this uh, this just a this lecture focusing on on back rank checkmates should be a reminder to you to just keep doing those tactics so that this kind of stuff comes quicker to you than ever. And a lot of tactics books won't tell you what the theme is, but eventually there are only so many different themes in chess, and you'll start to see similar patterns. Mm -hmm.